Hi, my name is James. Welcome to King's Fine Woodworking. Today I want to show you how I built these outdoor tables. I designed them to go with our Adirondack chairs and our Adirondack rockers, but I actually think they go with a wide variety of outdoor furniture styles. We've done a coffee table and an end table, and we have detailed plans for both of them. Link is in the description below. I wanted a design that looked a little more like some furniture, maybe even elegant, as opposed to an outdoor construction project. So I spent some time with the design and trying to make it actually easy to build. And on top of that, the whole thing can actually be put together with just two by fours. If you're one of our viewers who watch our videos and you like them, I would ask that maybe you take the time to click that button and subscribe for us. When I look at our statistics here, it looks like of all the people that watch our videos, 82% uh, are not actually subscribed. And actually only 17% of the people who watch them are subscribed. I'd like to see if we could turn that around and hopefully folks like you, if you like it, you can subscribe to our channel. Now, of course, I said you could make it from 2x4s. You will see me using several wider pieces here because I have some 2x12s and 2x8s and 2x6s left over from actually building some Adirondack chairs. And so I'm cutting them to approximate length. You see I've got a little mark on my uh, top of my table there. And once I've cut them to length, then I'm going to take them over to the table saw and I'm just going to rip them to width. Had this been a 2x4, I'd just rip it in half to get some 2x2s out of it. Uh, but it's wider, so I'll get a few more pieces out of this. We've got a few loose knot holes here. The knot holes are tight, I don't usually worry about them, but if they're loose, I like to seal them. Uh, so I start with some thin CA. Thin CA is really thin and even watery. It's just gonna soak right in right away, get down deep into the joint and help bond it there. I'll follow up with some medium CA after that. And this isn't gonna penetrate very deep uh, because it's more viscous. It'll get on the surface there. And I'll give it just a second to soak in. And then I'll hit it with some accelerator to cure it. And that's all I do. I'll do that on both sides since this particular knot goes all the way through. And I'll give it a minute or so to dry and then I'll just basically sand it down. And that'll just make sure that these knots don't fall out in the future. The first ripping you saw me do was to get the 2x2s two for the top and now I'm cutting the perimeter uh, board. It's a 2x4 that goes all the way around the top. And I've cut it at 45 degrees here. And it's important for you to check this. Uh, you can cut this on a table saw if you want, if you have a table saw sled. Or you can just cut it on a chop saw if your chop saw is accurate. And I'm going to show you how to just check it. You just cut a 45, put the two pieces together, and put a square up in the corner. And it should be spot on. If it's not spot on, you can definitely adjust your chop saw so that it cuts accurate 45 degrees. And then I'm going to mark, I need to mark this on the top side, so I'm doing it again for the camera here. I want to cut this at 24 inches. My, my coffee table is 24 by 48, and my end table is 24 by 24. So I'm going to draw a line there where my 48, I'm sorry, where my 24 inch mark is. And then I want to kind of get an idea where the 45 goes back. So I'm just using an ordinary speed square. I kind of put my pencil right on that corner, and this will give me an accurate mark. Then I always take a second to look at it from the end and make sure that the diagonal mark does line up accurately with the end mark. Then I'll put it in the chop saw. I'll get right up next to that line. I just don't want to make the line disappear, but everything right next to it. And give it a cut. It's important that these cuts are accurate. And I'll always check these with a tape measure when I'm done. And there it is, spot on at 24. If it's not, we can just shave a little bit more off. That's not really a problem. Now what I'm going to do is I need to cut several more pieces like this uh, for the ends of the coffee table and for all four sides of the uh, uh, end table. And so I'm going to go ahead and set a stop block. And I've put my one piece in here as a template, kind of a guide for the width that I want it. You can see that the saw blade came down and just perfectly scraped that edge. And this will be my uh, my mark to show me how uh, how to cut all of my other ones with my stop. That way they're all identical. If they're if they're off by just a fraction, it's okay as long as they're all identical. That's what the most important thing is. And so we'll just proceed through and cut the rest of those. I always take the time to set up a stop if I'm cutting three or more pieces. 
um, and I've checked that to make sure it's perfect. If I'm cutting less than three, I'll cut one to be exactly the way I want it, like for this 48 inch piece. And then I'll just set the one that's perfect on top of another one that I've already cut the 45 on one side and I'll make sure that they uh, line up perfectly. I'll just feel them to make sure they're perfect on the left there. And I'll slide that over and I'll bring this down and bring the chop saw down so it just scrapes against the edge of that top board. And this is how I will cut another piece. Since I'm only cutting two, I'm not really going to bother setting up a stop. I'll just do it this way. And that's plenty accurate. Now I'm going to move on to the skirt or the rail. Depending on where you're from, you may have a different name for it. This is going to go around all four sides and attach to the legs. It's going to give us some rack resistance, prevent our table from uh, racking and falling over. And we're going to kind of use the same technique here. I've marked the length, and now I'm going to transfer that uh, mark on the edge to the top. And then we'll just cut it in the same fashion. And we'll just move, move through these the same way we move through the top pieces until we get all of the rails cut. After that, we're going to move to the legs. So the legs have a bevel cut or a miter cut, I should say, on the bottom and on the top. And it's the same on the bottom and the top. And I've set the, uh, the miter there. So I'm just going to cut the bottom off. This board's a little longer than what we need. We'll take a measurement and I'll get it to the perfect length. And we're going to chop this at this length. And here again, it's really not critical if this length is exact. It can be off by a quarter inch. It doesn't really matter. What does matter is that all four legs are the same length. And you can see by putting that uh, miter that the legs are going to lean inward. Or it's going to cause them to splay out, basically. So I've got a stop block here that I've installed after checking it with my template piece, my first piece. So I'm going to cut my miter and then slide the board down. We don't want to flip the board, we'll just slide it down and cut the other miter, and that's going to give the same cut. So I'm going to move through all of the legs that way for both tables. And then I want to take it over to the table saw because I need to, to do a long taper cut. So I've got a tapering jig. I want the bottom to be about two inches wide, and we're going to taper that down to zero at the top. So we're basically going to remove this wood here. So I like to start with this and get a good layout, get, a, get it pencil marked exactly what I want to remove. And then I will set this on my tapering jig. And I'll line up that pencil mark exactly on the bottom because that's where it's going to be cut. And I'll move the fence on top of the tapering jig back and forth. We'll move it to get it in the exact spot, which I've already done there. And we want to make sure that that slid back to the stop, of course. And then we'll clamp down the board. And since the blade runs right along the edge of the tapering jig, it's going to cut off all the stuff that we don't want. And we're going to have one perfect leg. And we will do that with all eight legs. The four legs for the coffee table are a little shorter than the four legs for the end table. But the technique is exactly the same. And that's what a completed leg looks like in terms of shape. We're going to do some uh, profiling. Then it's on to some dados for the long boards and the tabletop. You see these mag switch feather boards are some of the most used tools in my shop. Uh, they keep me safe, they keep the wood tight to the table, and tight against the fence. If you're interested in these, I do have a link in the description below for them. They are fantastic. And there is the long dado that's going to hold the tenons from the top 2x2s two two that make up the inner field of the tabletops. Now I've got to cut those tenons. So we're going to have to use our table saw sled. And if you use my table saw sled, it comes with uh, adjustable removable inserts here. So I'm going to take this insert out and put one with a little bit of a wider slot in there. And that's going to allow me to cut dados. I can put my dado blade in and I can still use my table saw. If you haven't cut dados on a table saw like this with a sled, you're really missing out. This sure makes it easy. If you're interested in this sled, I have a link. I'll put a link in the description below uh, so you can go watch the video on how to make one of these. This is a fantastic tool. It's also a really well used tool in my shop. So I've adjusted the height of the blade to remove a half inch of material. Uh, basically, uh, this 2x2 two two is exactly 1.5 by 1.5. And, and so I'm going to take a half inch off the bottom and a half inch off the top, and that's going to leave me with a half inch tenon in the middle. 
and you can see I've got my stop block set on the left so I know not to go too far over. And it takes a couple of passes because I just left the same half inch width, half inch uh, wide dado in there that I used to cut those uh, those dado slots in the top boards. So it takes a couple passes, which is really pretty easy. I'll flip the board over and I'll cut the the two on the other side, and there it is. It's a tenon. Very easy to to adjust. Uh, you can do it on a scrap piece first, and you know micro tune the blade, get it go up or down a little bit as needed to get a nice snug fit. And there you have it. It's gonna that's how these are going to fit into the main field. And then, since I'm going to put a gap between the 2x2s, two I don't want to look at the top of the table and look between some 2x2s two and see the dado in that top board. So I'm going to cut these little pieces to fill the dado. At first I thought it was going to be kind of a tedious job to cut these, but it's really pretty quick. All right, so before we do any assembly, we're going to get on to some sanding and some profiling. So I'm going to start with the legs. And for the legs, I'm going to put a pretty strong bevel. And we'll see what this looks like here. I'm just putting this on the outside of the leg, not on the inside of the leg. But I'm going to put it on both sides of the outside. And that first cut just wasn't quite deep enough for my tastes. So I cut a little bit deeper. I do have plans for this project. If you're interested in getting plans to build this, I'll put that, a link to that in the description below and I'll show you exactly how deep to cut all these. And I think that's going to look really good like that. It's going to make that piece look just a little more elegant. And I'm going to use a, another chamfer bit and just take off a tiny bit from the inside so we don't have a sharp corner. that'll kind of fine-tune the looks of this leg. I wanted to mention if you enjoy our videos uh, you should consider subscribing. If you hit that subscribe button down below and the bell to get notified that really helps us out, helps our channel grow and we would appreciate that. Well there you have it. There's a completed leg. It's real simple. Once it has that router profile on it, it sure looks a lot better. And then I think I'm going to put one chamfer on the bottom, just the bottom, of all the rails. The rails are the ones that are going to connect into the legs all the way around. And that's going to enhance the look of the, the router uh, profiling on the leg itself. It's going to look something like that, and I think, that's going to, I think that's going to look good together. But like I said, these are all dimensioned out exactly in the plans. I'm kind of figuring my way through it here, and then... Once I'm done, I'm going to make a comprehensive set of plans that uh, detail exactly what I've done. And this is the 2x2, two two, one of the 2x2s two that goes to the top. I want to put a little chamfer all the way around this. So I'm not really worried about this fitting up tight against the, uh, against the, 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 the top board there. Um, because I'm worried maybe a tiny bit of a gap. And we're going to fix that in two ways. Uh, one is we're going to hide the gap with that chamfer, but two, if it's too long because of some error that you've made, no big deal. We just take it and we'll take some really rough paper, maybe some 60 grit, and just hit the end of this tenon to shrink it. So you'll cut everything at full size as if the tenon were going to fit perfectly. And then just take a moment and sand off a millimeter or two from the end of each of those, and then it will come down and fit snug. But like I said, you might still have some small error there, and rather than try to you know, hide that joint, make it appear that it's seamless, that's why I'm putting the, the chamfer on the 2x2s. Two It'll kind of highlight that. And this is the chamfer on the top of the rail that's going to complement the chamfer on the 2x2s two that stick together. This way, in case the joint isn't perfect, it's got a little bit of decorative appeal there. And then those little pieces we cut, we're going to put those things in here. And that is going to hide the space in between those tenons and make it look as if you cut a whole bunch of mortises. But of course you didn't. You just did a real easy dado rip right down the middle. And that's how that's going to look. Now for the bottom of the leg, I'm going to take some sandpaper and I'm just going to kind of round over 
all of these edges on the bottom because these tables tend to get scooted around on concrete or whatever and they'll chip and split off and once the edges are rounded uh, then these things will kind of slide around without chipping or, or scraping off the bottoms of the legs. And here we go. There are this, uh, the complete set of stuff for the coffee table and the complete set of pieces for the end table. And next we will move on to some assembly. Alright, so I'm going to show you what I think looks the best here and fits this, uh, this profile and this look perfectly. This corner right here, which I'm making a pencil mark on, this corner edge of the chamfer, you can see that there. Hopefully that pencil mark comes up on camera. I want it to line up perfectly with this edge of the rail. So I'm going to put that there and slide that back until it comes perfectly with that edge of the rail. And that's how I want the rails to contact the legs. Since the legs splay out, we just want to make sure that contact point there is at the front or at the top of the, uh, of the table. I'm building the table upside down here. So if you mark it like I did, put everything upside down, mark it like I did, then uh, it'll be easy to do. Put it in place and slide it back to the, those two pencil marks line up or until the corner of the uh, rail meets that corner of the chamfer. And then what we're going to do, there's a lot of ways that you could assemble this, and I'm going to kind of leave that up to you. I'm going to show you a really easy way to do it. With this way, you don't need a domino jig. You don't need anything. I'm just going to tack it together with some finish nails, which you could avoid if you had somebody to help hold it. And then I'm going to drill it and screw it. Now, on one side of each of these corners, the screws are going to be hidden because the leg that goes that way is going to go over the screws and they won't be seen. So I'm just drilling a hole, putting one screw, drilling another hole, putting another screw. So this corner has been glued and screwed. And then we're going to set the next one in place and it's going to hide those holes. Except you can see I have made a slight error. I should have drilled that hole just a little further back. But I'm going to fill that with putty and sand that later. Some putty that I make from sawdust from this wood and some glue. And you won't see it. Now I'm using Type Bond 3 which is a uh, highly water resistant, almost waterproof glue. It's made for outdoor use. You can even use Type Bond 2. Type Bond 3 is a little bit better. Gives you a longer open time and it has a stronger bond and it actually does a little bit better in the weather. All right, so I'm lining up that bottom corner just the way we talked about on the other side. And you see I did definitely make a mistake. That drill hole should have been further back in, but no big deal. We're going to fill that. I always have to decide if I'm going to um, do something else or, or not show you my error, but oftentimes I just end up showing you if I make an error. And sometimes that helps... Uh, uh, helps you find ways to conceal them. I think woodworking is full of errors. You make a lot of them and you become a good woodworker when you can hide them well. And you saw that I tapped those nails down below the surface. That way I can put a little bit of putty there too. And I used a countersink bit here that's going to allow me to put a, um, a plug in that hole. Same thing there, a good countersink bit is going to let me put a plug in that hole. And that corner is now secure also. And we'll just keep moving around the tabletop until we get all four legs and all four rails installed together. We need plenty of glue, of course. Glue is going to hold quite a bit of strength. Same thing here, you can see how I'm lining up that corner and we'll do the finish nails finish nails really help because they do hold it still and steady and they give a reasonably firm grip so that you can go through follow through and put some uh, holes in it with the drill you can see that top hole i managed to move it further back this time I, I learned my lesson from the from the first one that i did so when this rail goes on that will be hidden And I use the longest screws I can here. I use three inch deck screws. There'll be also a list of everything that I use to build this in the description down below. And if you get the plans, there'll be a list of everything in the plans as well. And I, I go on the internet, I find the cheapest links that I can find uh, for the material and I'll, I'll provide links for all that stuff. 
use the little nail set and get those nails a little bit below the surface so when we fill it with putty it won't be seen and there it is it looks like it's nice and flat that this is an advantage of having an assembly table my assembly table is dead flat and when i build something on it um if it m m matches perfectly all over the top of the table then it's also flat i can flip it upside down and i can see that all four legs touch equally so an assembly table is kind of a nice thing to have I actually built this one and I have plans for that too. If you're interested, I'll put a link to the description down below. You can watch the video how I how I built it. And so we're going to plug it. My daughter Sai cut the plugs for me with a plug cutter and a drill. It's not too hard. I didn't show that because I figure most of you probably know what uh, what the plug cutters and the drills look like. So we'll glue it and then we'll let that glue set up. I, I, what you need to do to make it look good and kind of disappear is I, you kind of should try to line up the grain with these to go horizontally like the grain on the rail. That helps it to not stand out quite as much, which looks a little nicer when you're sanding it and finishing it up. So once the glue is dry, then we'll cut it off. I like the Japanese pull saw. The flush trim saw and i'm going to make some putty when i do outdoor furniture i do softwood stuff especially like redwood here i like to use coarser sawdust i think it looks good it fills really well if i'm doing an indoor project um with a uh, hardwood i'll use some finer sawdust so that's it i'll just put that putty on there we're going to let that dry and then i'll sand it off so there's one more thing that i do want to do and that's i want to make some braces for the inside and I'll show you what I mean. I put these, I'm, I'm making a compound cut. I'm doing a miter and a bevel. Uh, the bevel is basically the angle that the legs splay out at, and the miter's at 45 degrees. This is a brace that's going to go on the inside between the legs and the rails and give us some extra strength. I just got to thinking, you know, if I sit on this table, I'm a pretty heavy guy, or if somebody wants to climb on the table, because inevitably this thing being outside, someone's going to stand on it, uh, I just wanted to be able to hold some strength. Um, I, I would consider these optional, you know, if you're not going to put any heavy weight on it, but uh, if you want to climb on it or you want it to last an eternity, I would put these in. And they're actually really easy to cut. You say just flip the board over and bring it to the stop and cut the next one. And I just keep going in that same pattern. Flip the board over, bring it over to the stop, and cut the next one. So you can cut 10 or 12 Real quick, you need, I think, eight. You'll need eight for two tables. I cut a couple of extras. So it's just going to look like this. And it's narrower than a two by four. And then as I slide it up, it gets tighter. As I slide it down, it gets looser. So you'll be able to slide it up and down until the two edges fit and it uh, butt, butts up against the leg as well. Then I'm going to glue it and screw it. We want it to hold securely. I meant to glue the the leg portion there where it touches the leg too, and I didn't, but I did on the others. So hold that in securely there for a moment until it uh, until it sticks to it. I'll do the same thing here. I'll put a couple of finished nails. If you do use finished nails in outdoor furniture, try to use galvanized nails. Galvanized nails aren't going to uh, corrode outdoors. And we'll drill with a little bit of countersink. And we'll put some long screws in there. I'm putting three inch screws there so I can get maximum depth, but I'm only gonna put two and a half inch screws in the side. This brace, as you can imagine, is really going to significantly increase the strength of the tabletop. It's not absolutely necessary, but it will make a big difference in overall strength. So I would recommend that you do it. There's a uh, Exactly how to do it will be detailed in the plans. So there we have it. There is the framework. All right, next step is to sand off these plugs. And once they're sanded off, they're really not that unsightly. But like I said, you could use dominoes to put this together. You can use dowels to put it together. Uh, I just wanted to show an easy way to do it with just screws um, and some plugs. A lot of ways that you can do it, and a lot of people building outdoor furniture aren't going to have expensive joinery methods or expensive joinery tools. All right, so now I have a syringe, and I'm going to put some epoxy in this. And this is how I'm going to assemble the 2x2s okay. into this dado slot. 
This is a 20 mil syringe. There's an eight gauge needle. It's a flat needle. You can actually get these on Amazon. And these are perfect for epoxy or any other adhesive that you would like to use. It keeps it nice and neat. It doesn't allow it to spill all over the place. You don't have to get brushes and you can just put it, uh, the adhesive right where you want to. I wanted to take a moment to talk about our community group. We have a, a community group on Facebook. Um, it's a private group. Only woodworkers are allowed into it. I'll put a link in the description below in case you are interested. But it's all about woodworkers helping other woodworkers. And if you have questions, you can post them in there. If you want to show off your work, you can post it in there. And it's, a, it's kind of a forum where woodworkers meet. Um, I also get advance notice sometimes on sales. I post that in the community group as well. And I spend about 10 hours a week in there uh, chatting and answering questions, stuff like that. So if that sounds like something that you're interested in, you might consider joining. And like I said, I'll put a link in the description down below. So you might notice as I'm gluing these on into the end that I've used these two Rockler wooden screw clamps, hand screw clamps. That's going to keep my board vertical and just kind of allows my hands to both be free for me to do this assembly. So it's really convenient sometimes to just hold things in place with something like this. It's not clamping it to the table, it's just keeping it in an upright position for me. Once I've worked to the end, I'm going to take a quick measurement here and make sure it matches the one I took on the other side to make sure that my 2x2s are actually centered in this piece. And then I'm going to jump to the top one. And I'm going to run epoxy all the way down there, both sides of this, and then slide it over the 2x2s. If you can see the tops of those 2x2s, the edge of the tenons, they're all chamfered just a little bit. That's going to allow this to slide on really easily. If you don't chamfer them, it's going to be much harder to put this on. All right, so flip this around, and I'll get epoxy on the other side. i got to make sure I do have the right side up. Remember, we're working on this table um, right here so that it's right side up. And I do have my bevel on this long board right side up. And watch how easy this slides on. When it's on a flat assembly table, it's going to slide on real easily because I have the ends of those tenons chamfered. If you've ever tried to glue up something with a lot of pieces that have to fit into a dado, it's really quite hard. But if you can lay them flat on a surface and you can have the ends of those tenons chamfered just a little bit, it goes together really easily. Just like that. Didn't take much effort at all. So I'll spread these apart because this is a slow set epoxy. It's going to take a while to cure. I'll spread them apart so that I can get these in. And these are a little tougher to put in because I've got to kind of get my fingers down in between there. It's kind of a tight spot. And so if you look closely, you'll see that I have I've chamfered two sides of that, or beveled there two sides of that, not the whole way, but just a little bit at the end. That'll get it started for me so that I can get it down into that dado. I'll show you a little closer here. That one's in focus. There we go. Yeah, and that'll help let it get into that dado much, much easier. Though not required, just something that uh, kind of helps with your assembly. So once they're in and moved down tight, I need to shift them all over a little bit because I want them centered on this board, just like the top ones are centered on it. So I've got a little board there with a tenon on it, and I'm just going to put it in here and tap it over until that's centered. All right, and that's that. Now it's time to put the, uh, the two sides of this tabletop on. So I'm going to use epoxy here too, and I realized right away that uh, this epoxy is very thin, you know, like most epoxies are, and it's just kind of running all over the place, and it's going to have to set slowly uh, overnight, and it's going to be a big mess. And so I decided I'm going to thicken the epoxy. If you thicken the epoxy, that's what this is. This is an epoxy filler, an adhesive filler, uh, West Systems 404. This is a high-density epoxy filler, and you can use just any epoxy filler here because we're not we're not looking for any particular type of structural strength. But you can add this basically to get the consistency that you want. And you see now the epoxy no longer runs. It's still high strength epoxy. It just won't run on us. And it's a much easier uh, uh, adhesive to apply. It'll hold in place. And, you know, whatever squeezes out the top also will sand off very easily. Even a little bit easier than straight epoxy does. So you can put on way too much like I'm doing here. Um, I am not going to be putting any screws or any other adhesives into this. You could if you want. You could put some dominoes. Uh, you could put some dowels, put some biscuit joint, anything that you might like to put in here. You can put some screws. Um, I happen to know it's not necessary. 
the, this, this miter joint is remarkably strong. In fact, uh, you know, Bourbon Moth Woodworking just put out a video and uh, measured the uh, strength of, uh, of a miter joint on boards and, and be amazed how strong it is. It's stronger than a dovetail joint. Um, I've known this from experience because I've built things like this and I've sat on the end of them and they don't break off. So I know it's very strong, but like I said, you're, you're free to put any type of, uh, uh, any sort of reinforcement at this corner if you feel that it's necessary for your application, but I think it's plenty strong and, and I do tend to overbuild things. So once that's done, we're going to clamp the tabletop together, get it under some pressure so that these joints have a chance to cure under pressure. That'll make them even stronger. And then once that's, I'm going to let that sit overnight, which is what we've done here. And then we'll take the clamps off and we can proceed. The first thing we're going to want to do is give everything a light sanding and sand the corners real well. I like to use a really coarse grit, an 80 or 100 grit to start off with for outdoor furniture. It's also going to help me get the epoxy off the corners. Then I'm going to flip the piece over and I'm going to do a big chamfer on the bottom. I'm not going to use a standard 45 degree bit. I'm going to use a 60 degree bit. So it means it's going to cut in uh, more than it cuts down. And it's going to give us a pretty neat profile, I think, when you look at it from the side. It makes the tabletop look a little thinner, and that, of course, uh, lends itself towards a more elegant look there as well. And then I'm going to give the top a very small chamfer. This is with a 45 degree chamfer bit. And I won't make it too big. You know, you can just kind of do this uh, to taste to whatever you like. It is marked what we did it uh, on our plans. And then I like to sand over that too. And that's kind of the edge profile of the tabletop. I think that looks nice. Now we have to mount the tabletop uh, to the table frame and legs itself. So I'm just going to use some boards, uh, some 2x2 two two that I had left over. I'll sand them, maybe I'll chamfer the tops on them so they're not sharp underneath there. We'll get them centered. I'm going to use 2 inch outdoor screws for this. It's going to go, I'm going to countersink it just a teeny tiny bit, so it's going to go all the way through the top piece and, you know, half inch, maybe five eighths of an inch into the 2x2 uh, the two two, that is the tabletop. I'm not really worried about expansion or contraction here. Uh, this softwood's going to flex and move and stretch uh, if, the, if the table expands and contracts with the weather. I've done tons of outdoor furniture that's lasted 30, 40 years outside, so it's not like indoor furniture where you have to have uh, leave room for expansion and contraction. It's just not necessary for outdoor stuff. And I'll just put one of these little brackets that I'm putting in here all the way around to hold the tabletop on very securely. And that's it. This is now a completed coffee table. And I think this did what we set out to do, and that was to make something that looks more like a piece of furniture. I think a lot of my early outdoor furniture projects, the ones I did back in the 80s and 90s, they just looked a lot more like a construction project than a piece of furniture because you know I was using dimensional lumber from the store. But I think we've turned that around here and we do have a piece of furniture that can be enjoyed. And of course, I do have a matching end table here. And the end table is two foot by two foot. It is taller than the coffee table. It's a standard end table height. That's our dog, Princess, there. She's uh, checking it out. And there it is without her. And the coffee table is two foot by four foot, which is a pretty standard coffee table dimension size. And you can see the pair of them here. And that's it. That wraps up the video. Uh, like I said, if you're interested in the plans, the plans do include all the detailed dimensions and how to for both of these. Thanks for watching.